Hi clothing one! Welcome to my sewing room at my home. The point of this video is to show you how the process works to make your pair of pajama pants. It's a really fun project, it's a great thing to start off with, and I'm really excited to get going. The first thing that you need to decide is which pattern you're going to be using. Luckily, I have chosen for you because that's my job. What I look for when I'm looking for a pattern is the easy sign, first of all. No offense to you guys, but you all are beginners, so I want to find something that's doable for you. The next thing I look for is the different options that the pattern gives me. In this particular pattern that we're going to be using, it gives me lots of different options, including a shirt, a onesie, an applique, peace sign, which I doubt anyone wants, but it's all there for me, as well as a pair of pajama pants. I also am looking for anything that tells me if there's any pockets, any snaps, anything that makes it a little more difficult. This one does not have pockets, although you can put pockets in easily if you want to. And you can also make them joggers, which we'll talk about later. All right, so once we figured out that this is the pattern that we want, we need to figure out what type of fabric we're gonna buy. On the back of the envelope, there's lots of information. Luckily for you, this is all in, in French on this side, so you don't need to pay attention to it. Right up here at the top, it's gonna tell me the different types of fabric that I can use. I've chosen to do pattern D. So I'm gonna look right here where it says pattern D for suggested fabrics. For the pants or the jumpsuit, I need cotton flannel or cotton knit. Now, knit is really difficult to work with. It's stretchy. It's what your t-shirts are made out of. It's often thin. You need a different needle, and you need a different stitch for it. So I don't recommend that, and that includes fleece. They're really difficult to work with. So instead, I want you to use what, I, what we mean by flannel. So here's some leftover flannel from a, another project that I was doing. It's not stretchy. It's woven, and it's really nice to use. If I were at the store and buying this, my fabric would come on something like this. It's called a bolt, okay? The bolt of fabric is also gonna have information at the top. It would be a good idea to take a picture of it if you're at the store. It tells me the price right here, what it's made out of, and how to care for it, like washing machine or iron. I also got this for like $2.49 a yard, so I'm pretty good at deals. Before we even move on, what I want to differentiate is the term pattern and design. When I say pattern, I mean this, not this. This is the design of the fabric. What is on the fabric is the design. This is the pattern. And yes, in real life, we'll say pattern meaning design, but in this class, when I say pattern, I mean this, the envelope. Okay, so we've chosen our fabric, we've chosen our pattern, now we need to figure out how much fabric to buy. So that's when we'd go and we'd measure ourselves or measure whoever we're, um, we're, we're making our pair of pants for. With this pair of pants, you can see that the sizes are right here. It's gonna ask you for the bust or your chest, your height, or not sorry, your, your, I need to read it, your waist, your hip, and your back waist length. Now, if you think about it, do you really need your chest size for your pair of pants? No, that would be for the shirt that it's asking you. So really, all I want to do is measure uh, my waist and my, my, um, my hips as well. And luckily for me, I've got a really cool little model. I have a lot of students who give me old mannequins, so I'm going to use her as an example. To measure our waist, we're going to be measuring kind of the innermost side part of our sides. And luckily for women, we kind of have a natural hourglass shape. And for men, it's going to be a little more difficult, but you kind of just need to settle the, the measuring tape in to figure out kind of where that where that fits. We want the measuring tape to be parallel to the ground and not bent like this because that's going to be inaccurate. And you don't want it to be super tight. You want it to kind of have room for your finger to go in. So this is about 25 and a half inches. When it goes to the waist, it's going to be about four inches below, uh, or the hips are about four inches below the waist. It's also kind of the widest part of your, your middle section. And to be a little crude, it's a little bit like right next to where your butt crack starts. So sorry about that. This one is 35 inches. So we have 25 and a half and 35 inches. What I'm going to do next is take a look at my pattern. And I'm going to find waist, circle 25, because she was right about there. And hip is about 30, 35. So she's literally right between a small and a medium. So that's kind of frustrating. You need to decide yourself. If you fall between two measurements, you, know, you need to decide, okay, um, do I want my pair of pants to be tight-fitting? Do I want them to be loose-fitting? What does that actually mean to you? 
okay? So I'm going to decide for her that she needs a medium just because she's maybe a growing girl. <laughs> and a medium probably fits me as well after doing my own measurements. One thing I want to tell you guys is that the stores that you buy clothes at do something called vanity sizing, which means there's no standardized sizing chart for any store. That means if you walk into Gap and you try to buy a pair of jeans, you might be a size 12. But when you go into Banana Republic, you're going to be a size 10. It, they don't have any standardized sizing, like I said. So Banana Republic might try to market their products to you by making you feel skinny when you walk into their, their store because you fit into a smaller size. So it's kind of evil. That means that if, when you're checking on your sizes, if you end up being a bigger size than what you normally are, don't read into it. Don't be scared of it. It's just kind of the fact that no one else has standardized except for these patterns. Okay. So we figured out that we're going to go with medium and we're going to go with a flannel. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my medium, circle that right here, boom, like that, and go all the way down to where my pants are. And I'm going to need two and five eighths yard. If I was at the store, I would take this up to the counter and I'd say to the person behind the counter, I need two and five eighths yard and they would cut it for me. If I have a pattern that is uh, one directional, which means it's it's horizontal stripes or it's got words on it, I can only go one way, you might buy more than two and five eighths. You might buy three yards of fabric to give yourself some extra room um, to match all of your pattern. This one is multi-directional. It goes lots of different ways. So I would buy just two and five eighths. If you're buying this online, you can't buy two and five eighths. You have to bump up to three, which is not a problem. Having extra is always a good thing. I'm going to be cutting this at my, my home, so I'm going to use my measuring tape and measure it out and cut it. The last thing I need to do before I get started on this project is wash my fabric. It's very important that you wash your fabric first before you start cutting it out uh, because it's going to shrink, especially cotton. Um, and you also want to wash things that aren't cotton, even if they won't shrink, just because you don't want to make this beautiful article of clothing, wear it, wash it, and then have it turn a different color or, or shrink. So you want to make sure that you do that before you actually make the garment. So I'm going to go wash my fabric after I cut it, and then I'm going to come back and show you what you do next. Okay. Cool. All right. My fabric is cut and in the washing machine. In the meantime, I'm going to get my pattern ready. So I'm going to start on step 18 on the interactive notebook. It's written in a way that's step by step and really easy to use. So the first thing says remove the entire pattern from the envelope. Uh, I will tell, be honest, this is my least favorite part because once you take this out, it's really hard to get it back in. But you're ready for it at this step. The next thing it says is on the guide sheet, which is this piece of uh, information right here, it says circle the cutting layout you'll use. Okay, so my cutting layout, I've got two pages of instructions, is on my first page, like so, and it says cutting layouts right here at the top. I know that I'm doing pattern D for the pants, so I'm going to find that right here. If I had a highlighter, I'd use a highlighter. Oh, and there's my cat. She wants to join us today. Okay, so I'm going to circle pants D. And notice that there are three different pieces of information, and actually there's four if you look up here. Okay, So I can tell that it's all under Pants D because there's a line separating it from the other options that I have in my pattern. So it says that it's 45 inches, 45 inches, 60 inches, or 60 inches. And what that refers to is the width of your fabric. Most likely you have chosen 45 inches of fabric. That's the width. Remember that we bought two and five eighths yard, but the width is something that's predetermined based on what you bought. Okay, so most likely it's 45 inches. And then it also tells me different sizes. So this first cutting layout is for extra small, and then the second one is for small, medium, large, and extra large. So I'm going to fit right there in that medium, so I'm going to give that a circle as well. May is really interested in this piece of paper. This cutting layout is really important to me because it's going to tell me how I lay my fabric out and how I lay my pattern on my fabric. I can't just lay my pattern anywhere and just expect it to be okay. The reason that is, and I don't have my fabric with me because it's in the washing machine, is that fabric has a certain stretch to it. Here's some other random fabric. Okay, So if I stretch it this way, you can see it's decently stretchy. 
And if I stretch it this way, it's not stretchy at all. And if I stretch it on the bias or at, at an angle, it's really stretchy. So when I'm cutting out my fabric, I can't just lay it anywhere because I might get a different stretch to it. So I want to follow what it's telling me to do. Okay, so I've selected the cutting layout that I'm gonna use. And then it says, select the pattern pieces for the view that you're sewing. Wow, that's confusing, right? The view refers to, is it A, B, C, D, or E? And we're doing D. On um, this part right here of my guide sheet, it gives me the, all the pattern pieces that are found in this tissue paper, okay? I want to find the things that deal with D and D alone, okay? So I'm going to circle that right here. So all of the pieces that I need, it says pants D right there. It's front, back, and tie. Those numbers are 6, 7, and 8. Easy enough. Okay. So it says, select the pattern pieces for the view you're sewing. And now I need to go, my other cat is freaking out, causing this one to freak out too. I think we're going to be okay. Now is not the fun part. It can be, but I hate unfolding this. Now I need to find six, seven, and eight in here. So I'm going to unfold each and every one of them. And when I find them, I'm going to circle them. Okay, so I found my pieces and I have put them in a pile, kind of on the floor. Okay, then it says fold the rest of the pattern pieces and put them back in the envelope. So I'm not gonna need these pieces right here, but I can save them if I wanted to make the shirt or the, um, the jumpsuit or anything like that. So I can save that if I wanted to. And I'm gonna put these back in the envelope. These are really hard to fold back up if, if they're not like this. I suggest if you want to keep them organized, iron them flat and they'll stay a little bit better. Okay, now it says the big one. Cut apart any pattern pieces printed together on one large piece of tissue paper. You do not need to rip away any extra tissue paper from around the edges. This will be cut off as you cut out your fabric. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do in my next video. I'm going to lay that out for you guys. Okay. So I found all of the pieces that I need to cut out. The first one I'm going to start with is number six. And I'm going to try to cut this with the cat laying on my cutting table. But we'll see how that goes. Okay. So when I'm cutting apart my pattern pieces, I do not need to cut on any line. I'm just cutting all around the lines just to get them apart from each other. So I don't have to be very good at this. I'm using paper scissors for this. I'm just cutting around my pattern pieces. The size I chose to do is a medium, and I'm not cutting exactly on that medium line. I'm just cutting outside of it, and you're going to see that my cutting is pretty crappy, and that's okay. The one thing you want to watch out for is to make sure that you don't cut when it's folded, because you might cut into your pattern piece. Let's say that you accidentally cut your pattern piece into your line, and you have a whoopsie. Oh. Someone wants to play. It's okay. You can just tape it together. It's not the end of the world. A lot of people are scared about cutting this apart because the tissue pattern paper is really fragile, and that's okay. Just take your time. It helps if it's laid out flat, unlike what I was doing. I was trying to accommodate this girl. Okay, and here is my pattern piece. It's not perfectly cut, but it doesn't need to be. So I'm going to go ahead and do that with the rest of them as well. The last piece it has to cut me out, has me cutting out, is number eight. And number eight, if you read it on the pattern, it says it's for the tie. So if I wanted to make a really cool little tie, I could do that. For this project, I decided I'm not going to do any frills. And so I'm not going to cut out number eight. I'm just going to do seven and six. And that's okay if you do the same thing too. Okay, great. So we're done with that. I'm going to look at my instructions and see what's next. Now it says, write your name on the guide sheet on the pattern envelope in all of your pieces. So if you're doing this in class with everyone, it's really easy to lose your pattern pieces with everyone else's. So it's important that you write your name or your initials on it so that we can figure out whose is whose. I'm doing this at home, so I'm gonna skip that step. 
The next thing says to smooth out the pattern pieces. We want them to be as least wrinkly as possible, right? So there's some big wrinkles in there. So I can those take those over to my iron and ironing board and just iron them really quickly. You don't have to iron it on high heat. I just put it on a low heat and get it nice and warm and not hot and I'll just press my pieces so that they lay flat. I'm gonna do that real quick. The next step says on a multi-sized pattern, mark cutting lines for your size with a highlighter. So what that means is, if you look right here, there are three different sizes in this pattern. So it's multi-size. It's not just small. It's extra small, small, and medium. And the other pattern has large and extra large. These lines can be hard to see when you're cutting out. They kind of blend together sometimes, even though you can see that they have different markings. The extra small has little dots and dashes. Uh, the medium, or the small has dashes, and the medium is a solid line. Well, if you're that small, that can be a hard thing to see. So what I like to do is I like to take a highlighter and I'll just highlight the line that I'm working on. I also like to highlight anything that looks like this. This is called a notch. Okay, a notch is a way that we match up our ends together, right? So if I make a notch here, I'm going to make a notch on two sides of pants, and then they'll match up like puzzle pieces. So they're very important that we get those out. Instead of following the line and cutting them in like this, I cut them out like this, okay? So when I go highlight my whole size, so I'm a size medium, I'm gonna highlight all the way up to here, and then I'm gonna highlight out my notch. So when I go cut my fabric with my pattern piece on it, I cut out like that. The reason I go out is it keeps my fabric from fraying. If I cut in like this, I'm cutting into my seam allowance, and it can fray a little bit more, and it's more likely to rip than going out like this. This is a piece that no one will ever see. In fact, you can cut it off when you're done, but it's quite nice to have. You can see on this side, I've got double notches. The double notches will match up with the other double notches, and the single notches will match up with single notches. So when I'm highlighting, I'm gonna come down here, and I just make kind of like a square or a plateau like this, so that when I cut it out, I cut it out like that. If you forget to make your notches, it's not the end of the world, it does make your life more difficult. And on this project, it's not a huge big deal, but if you're gonna make projects in the future and you forget to cut your notches out, it's gonna be kind of hard to make sure that you're accurate. Okay, after you've highlighted all of your pieces and you know what size you're working with, we need to, as according to the next step, make adjustments for height at this point. See picture below. So in your interactive notebook, you'll see the instructions for this. It's important to follow along to the video and the instructions as well, because this is kind of a difficult thing to do. When we chose our size earlier, and I chose that I was a medium, I chose that only based on my width at that point, right? Because I measured around me. I didn't ever measure my length, and that's what we're going to do right now. When you make your own clothes, the cool thing about that is you get to make it exactly to your measurements. So if you've ever been frustrated with a pair of pants before that kind of fit, but not really, this is your chance to make a pair that fit you exactly the size that you want. Some people like wearing high water, so they like having their pants up high. Uh, they might like it, I don't know, for, for whatever reason. And some people, like when I was in high school, we liked when our pants dragged on the ground because we were so cool, right? Oh, please, please forgive me for that. Um, but I loved having really, really baggy pants. And now I kind of like it just right at the ground. I don't like it dragging anymore. So that's what we're going to do right now. This is kind of a difficult concept to, to follow along with, so again, make sure you're looking at the interactive notebook. The first thing that I like to do is measure my pattern piece. So the pattern has lots of different clues on it that will tell you where your, your pants are going to lie on your body. Um, I'm holding up number seven, which is the back. I can tell it's the back because it literally says it right here on the pattern piece. And right next to it, it says the words waistline, and there's my cat right there. Okay, so waistline is where it's going to fall on your waist. So we can use that to help us measure uh, on our own body. The other thing I want to show you is the bottom of the pants. Some pants have more flare than others, but you can kind of see, if you look at this medium line, that right here, the pants start to kind of flare out. Okay, what that means is that at the end of your pants, you're going to roll them up and then sew them, and that's how you're going to finish the end there. So we want to account for that. So it's about an inch. 
okay? So I'm going to subtract an inch when I'm doing my measuring. Excuse me, Kitty, you're right in my way. There you go. Sweet thing. Okay, so I'm going to take my measuring tape and start at my waistline, making sure this is all laying flat on my table or on the ground, wherever you can do this. And I'm going to measure from the waistline to where my pants start to flare out. Now, if that's hard to see, I'm going to measure to the very end and then subtract an inch. Okay, so from, from the waistline to the medium line is 43 and a half inches. And I'm going to subtract one inch just for the fact that I'm going to hem it up. So I write that down. It's going to be 42 and a half inches from my waist to the bottom of my pants. Next, I'm going to measure myself, and this is actually really hard to do. I'm going to just kind of guesstimate right now. The best thing that you can do is just have someone help you hold it. I'm going to take my measuring tape and I'm going to hold it at my waist. And remember that for us, our waist is actually up here, not here. That's our hips. So I'm going to hold it right here, and I'm going to have someone measure me all the way down. And I'm just going to take a guess, just looking at that really poorly as best as I can. that I'm at a 40, so that's 40 inches. So I'm gonna write that down here. Okay, so the pants measured 42 and a half inches long, and I want them to be 40 inches long. So if I subtract that, that means I need to take two and a half inches off. And I'm kind of um, not a stickler for being exact. If I have a half an inch, I'm just gonna get, just ignore that because I would prefer to have my pants be too long than too short. So instead of taking off two and a half inches, I'm just simply gonna take off two inches. Okay, so I wanna take off two inches. I cannot just take the bottom of my pants and whack it off two inches. Remember that our pants kinda of have a flare to them and they'll be hemmed up slightly. So if you just whack off the bottom, it's gonna mess everything up really badly. My first year teaching, I didn't understand that, and I had someone make pants that were way too long, and I was just like, just cut them off and roll them up, and it, mess, it made a lot of mess when she was trying to sew those up. So I've learned a lot since then, and the thing I've learned is something called an adjustment line, which is this piece right here. There are two adjustment lines on your, pant, pa, pa, ooh, on your patterns. The bottom one is for your like length of your leg, and then the top one is for your crotch line. So if you want your pants to be really baggy or you want them to be tight, I found that I don't ma I don't need to mess with this one quite as much. I don't mind if it's a little extra baggy. She does though. So in order to shorten my pair of pants, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold on the shorten or lengthen line, or the, it's called the adjustment line. I'm going to just fold it with my fingers as best as I can, like that. And then I'm going to fold it over an inch. Remember that I'm trying to take off two inches, but if I fold it over an inch, <laughs> she's too curious for her own good. If I fold it over an inch, it technically is two inches. Kitty. So I'm going to take my measuring tape. She's a sweet girl, but she's just too curious. I take my measuring tape and I'm going to measure my fold. So from where the fold is to where the edge of my other fold is should be one inch because watch this. When I open that up, it's actually two inches. Okay, so once again, I'm going to fold this like this and then drop it down an inch because when I open it up, it's two inches. I want you to notice that you've got something called your grain line going throughout your whole project, your pattern. You see that grain line? It's got a little arrow on the end. The grain line will help you keep your pants straight. So as you're folding this, you want to make sure that your pants line up so that is one straight line and it's not crooked. Okay? So do you see? Let's show you real quick. This would be bad, having my grain line not match up. And once you've got it lined up just ever so straight, then you can take a piece of tape and pop that down right there. You would need that to, to do that to both pattern pieces, both your front and your back, otherwise it'll end up all funky. Okay, let's say that you have the opposite problem of me. You are too tall for your own good. 
you're going to be doing essentially the opposite of what I just did. Instead of folding the adjustment line, what I'm going to have you do is take a pair of scissors and cut straight down that adjustment line. And then, if you needed to add two inches, you would take another piece of paper. Some people will even use the leftover edges of their pattern paper over here because there's some like extra room. And you'll cut that out to be about two inches and you'll stick that in between your two cut out pieces of paper and tape that in there. So you're essentially just like putting a stint in. You're adding more, more length in that adjustment line. It's definitely trickier to do that. It's not quite as fun. Let's say that you're about an inch off. Um, I want you to think about the fact that you can, you can adjust slightly to make, you know, you, when you're wearing your pants. An inch is not very much to take, put on or take off. So anywhere beyond that, you probably want to do these adjustments. But if you're within an inch, you can call it good and not do this step. But this is kind of a crucial step to make sure that you've got exactly what you need. I know that I had a student um, really not care about this project, and he went to measure himself, and he did not do a good job. And he ended up with pants that were higher than his ankles, and he was like, whatever, I don't care. And I was really sad for him because I knew that he actually did care. So once you've done that, you're ready to go. This is a tough step, so just take your time. Um, just think through it. I write everything out, even if it's stupid math. This was easy math to do. I still write it out just to make sure. And if you, but when you are done, I, the only problem is I have not taped it because I don't have my tape right here with me right now. Once you're done, it's always good to do what I call a dummy check. Like it's something that a dummy could understand. I will take my pattern piece, this is my back, and I will literally place it on my body using the waistline. There's the waistline, I'll put it on my waist and I'll check it. And if it fits nicely, like it falls where I want it to, then you've probably done something correctly. If it still does not fit you and does not look right, you gotta you gotta remeasure yourself, remeasure your pattern, try it one more time. But again, it's always helpful to do what I call again the dummy check just to make sure it works. So now that my pattern is cut apart, my fabric is washed, dried, and ironed, I'm ready to lay out my pattern on my fabric. Now I want to remind you that you can't just lay your fabric down any way you want and then your pattern on top of it. There's a specific way that the company or the, the person who made the pattern wants you to do that and that's found right here in the cutting layout that we circled earlier. So there's a couple of clues that we need to use that they give us here. So I've circled the one that we're going to use and I want you to take a look real quick at all the terms right there. It gives us two selvage edges and a fold. So what that means is we know we're going to be folding our fabric in half at least just once because there's only one fold. And as you've done some research, you'll know that there's, art, there's something called a selvage edge, which on my fabric is actually this part of the fabric right here that has a white edge on it. This is a woven piece of fabric that has, it does not tear apart easily. The opposite end of that is called the cut edge. And you can see as I have washed and dried it, it's kind of come unraveled a little bit. That's okay, it's pretty natural for it to happen. But this is the cut edge, and the non-frayed um, end is the selvage edge. So using that information, I can tell that this is going to be a lengthwise fold because my selvage edges are touching. I can also tell that there's a difference in color. Do you see that little uh, gray strip right there? That refers back to the cutting layout right here where it says right side of the fabric. So according to this picture, I'm putting my selvage edges together with the right side of my fabric on the inside. So when I take my fabric, it's kind of hard to do this with your two and five eighths because it's really long. But I'm going to open up my fabric like this. I'm going to put my right side of my fabric in and I'm going to put my two selvage edges, the two edges that are really nice and clean, together. And that's how I'm going to fold it. Now I have a really small table I'm working on. Usually um, in my classroom I have people put two tables together, or a lot of students choose to do this on the floor. For right now I'm going to try to do it right here on the small table so I can show you what I'm doing. Okay, the goal then is to have your selvage edges matching the entire length of your fabric and then when when your fabric is laid out what I like to do is I just like to pet it and smooth it out with my fingertips I'm not stretching the fabric I'm just smoothing it out there should be no wrinkles and again 
throughout the entire project, the whole time, we want to make sure that our selvage edges are matched up. I have not done a great job, but I'm just going to skip that for just right now so I can show you. When I'm done with the video, I'm going to spend a little more time I'm probably going to do it on the floor and make sure it's lined up really nicely. Okay, the next clue it's going to give us um, is where these pieces go. Okay, so I need my six and my seven, and if I look, they, they go in a specific direction. So I'm going to grab my six and my seven and put them on. like so, matching what it shows me on that cutting layout. Now you can't see that right now because my camera screen is too small, but I'm going to match that as best as I can to make it look exactly like this. If you're working with a different pattern and you've got something a little more difficult, you definitely want to pay attention to these colors right here because sometimes you might have patterns that are flipped upside down, um, that go different ways, so it's important to really pay attention to this as best as you can. Okay, so I'm going to just look at your interactive notebook real quick to make sure that I'm not missing something. And that's something that I want you to do as well because this is kind of a complicated step. So the first thing that we do is if we had pieces of fabric, or I'm sorry, pattern pieces that are on the fold, they would need to uh, go on first. And what I mean by fabric that or pieces that go on the fold are pieces that maybe go on the fold of the fabric that do not get cut so that when they open up, it's like a mirror. And imagine an apron. If I were to make an apron, and I only had half an apron pattern, what I would do is I'd put that half on the fold so when it opened up, I would have two. One time I had a student do this and she didn't recognize that she was on the fold, and she cut the fold. So when she made her apron, there was a, uh, she had to have a seam right down the middle and it looked really bad. In this project, you don't have any on the fold pieces, so we can move on. Then we want to go with the big pieces, which you only have two pieces that you're working with and they're both big, but if you were working with something that had small pockets or cuffs or hoods or things like that, those would go on after the big pieces. Okay, number two says pin pattern pieces that have a grain line arrow, and we want to pin at the end of each arrow. Okay, so ready for this. This is an important step, and it's complicated, so let me get ready to show you. When we lengthened and shortened our pants, we used our grain line arrow to make sure that our pants were uh, straight. The same thing goes here. Okay, so here's our grain line arrow. That's going to have us match up exactly with our selvage edge. So I'm going to kind of zoom out without trying to drop my computer. Okay, so here's my selvage edge. Here's my grain line. These two things need to be as parallel as possible. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to eyeball it, okay? So just eyeball, eyeball, okay? And just if it looks pretty okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pins and I'm going to pin on both sides of the arrow, just like that, just to hold it down, okay? And now I'm going to take my handy dandy measuring tape and measure from, I'm going to show you over here, from one edge of the selvage right here to the edge of my fabric and that's about 12 inches. It doesn't really matter what it is, but I'm going to come back here. And when I do it here, it's 11 inches. That means that my, my pattern is off. So I'm going to take out one of my pins and gently smooth down my pattern until it reaches 12 inches. And when it does, I'm going to repin it. And then I measure again. It's important that you are always measuring over and over and over again. It takes a while but it's definitely worth it. Okay, so I've got 12 inches there. I've got 12 inches there. And that's gonna tell me that my pattern is on my fabric correctly, and it's level, it's even. This is gonna make it so that my pants don't stretch in a weird way. Once I've got my two pins on there, I'm gonna move my, my fabric over and put my, ne ooh, put my next pattern piece on as well and do the same thing. Okay, we're going to pretend, yay, magic of this movie, that I have pinned on both of my pieces and I'm ready to pin the whole thing now. So I'm going to take my handy dandy pin cushion. Mine is a uh, magnet, so it's really nice because I can just kind of literally throw my pins at it and they'll stick. It's really nice. Okay, so when I pin the rest of this, I want to start where I have my pins in the center and smooth out my, my pattern piece to the edge. And then I'm going to drop my pin down. It's going to be perpendicular with my line, 
but it's not going to cross my line. So here's my line right here. The head of my pin isn't extending over it because then when I come to cut it, I won't have to take my pins out. I put a pin about a, a hand's width away. It doesn't really help you if you have a lot of pins unless you have really slinky, slippery fabric. When I get to the corners like this, do you see my corner? Instead of pinning perpendicularly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pin um, diagonally like this. All the while making sure that I don't leave any bumps in there. If either of your fabric or your pattern is wrinkly, you want to stop and make sure you iron it out. If you've got a wrinkle in there and you go cut the wrinkle, it'll make a huge mess. So make sure it's all smoothed out. So there we go. That's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to do the magic of television and do this really easily on the floor or on a larger table. And when I get back, I'll show you what it looks like. All right, here we go. This is the hardest part for most people to do because it's really the only time in sewing that what you do matters. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you can't uncut something. You can unsew something, but you can't uncut something. So a couple of things to, to keep in mind. This in the inside is the sharpest part of the scissors, and so this is where we want to do most of our cutting. It's tempting to, to do our cutting up here because it snips a little easier, but every time you snip, you might make a little jagged edge. So try your best to do long, even strokes through the inside of the, of the blade. Okay, make sure that you check for any notches and to cut those notches out, so go nice and slow so you recognize those. If you've used a highlighter or a pen or pencil to mark those out, that should help you. And if you haven't done that yet, this is a good opportunity to do so. Uh, if you are left-handed, try to find yourself a nice pair of left-handed scissors. Sorry if you don't ha find a pair. Um, and then what I like to do is I like to cut in the direction that's easiest on my hand. So for me, I'm going to go counterclockwise, but um, for my left-handed people, it might be easier for you to go clockwise. And if you don't really care, it doesn't really matter to me. <sighs> you ready for this? We did it! The fabric is cut out. That is the scariest part of this whole process. Everything else is easy because now if you make a mistake, you can always seam rip, so that's a good thing. So now I'd like to talk to you about how to go about reading your directions. It is kind of confusing, and so um, I, I want to teach you how to read directions rather than how to just follow my video. So I want to show you that for just a second. On your, um, on your guide sheet, there's lots of information. It's worthwhile to look through it. It, it will talk you through maybe some te techniques that you're going to use. But I'm going to skip around just a little bit and go to the next page. And here it gives me my sewing directions. This first piece of information right here is the fabric key. So what that means is there, there will be different colors and different shades that represent uh, different sides of fabric. So if you look at some of these pictures, like this one for instance, you can see that there's some white and then there's some dark. And that refers to different things. The dark means it's the right side of the fabric and the white means it's the wrong side of the fabric. You don't have to worry about these other things because we don't need them at the moment. So when you're looking at your pictures, one key that they're going to give you again is the coloring and you can tell if you're working on the right side or the wrong side. Then it's going to give us some information about seam allowances. Right here at the very top, it says use 5 8 seam allowances unless otherwise indicated. That means throughout the entire project, you're going to be using 5 8 seam allowance. You're not going to just throw in your fabric in your machine and just hope that it's the right size. It should be 5 8 unless it tells you otherwise. On my sewing machines at school, 5 8 equals the 15 line. So almost every time you sew, you're going to match up the edge of your fabric with the 15 line. You're going to see that I'm using my own home machine, um, and I have a different type of seam allowance. So it's just a, it's a different measurement system. But you will also see that I put a little piece of blue tape where my 5 eighths is to make it easier for me to see. So I try to always mark it so it makes it easier for me. Okay, so now that we've got that, we're going to skip around 
This is intimidating because there's a lot of information on here. But remember that this information is all about making the shirts and everything else besides the pants. So I'm skipping to the part where it just says pants right here. What I like to do, because this is confusing for me, is I'll take a highlighter, which I don't have a highlighter, so I'm just going to, excuse me, circle all of the steps that I need to do so I'm ready for them. I can easily see them. And then when I'm finished with them, I will cross them off. It's really important that you do this. It just makes your life a lot faster and a lot easier. So we're just going to go ahead and start on the first step. I'm going to make it nice and easy for you to see. It says, stitch front number six to back number seven together at inner leg. Okay? That's kind of confusing if it's the first time you've read this. So let me read it again knowing the information that we have that I said previously. We're going to stitch front, which is number seven, or number six, to back. So I'm going to take one leg that I've cut out that's number six, and one leg that's cut out that's number seven. Looking at the picture, I can see that I've got my right sides together because it looks like the dark sides are touching. I'm going to be stitching them together at the inner leg with 5 8 seam allowance. And if you take a look at the picture, you can even see that it gives you a little string right there. That's where you're going to be stitching. Notice that it does not have you stitching up here at all. It is just the inner leg, that's it. And you're gonna do this twice to both your front and your back. So when you cut out your pieces like this, when you go to open it up, you should have two. One, two. Don't sew the two sevens together and the two sixes together. You wanna sew one number seven and one number six. The other thing I wanted to show you that's really awesome about the way that they make these patterns is that you should have a notch that matches up right here. So at that inner leg on your six and your seven, you will have a notch that matches up perfectly. Isn't that cool? Take a look right up here at the top. Do you see that you've got a double notch here and a single notch? Those should not match up together. They're around the same spot, but they don't match up perfectly, and that is okay. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to unpin my fabric. Um, some people... Uh, get confused about which is a six and which is a seven. So one thing that you could do is you could take some masking tape, write six on it, and stick that on your fabric. If you have fabric that is not easy to tell which side is the right side and which side is the wrong side, you need to follow my instructions. So for instance, mine is very obvious which is right and wrong. But there are fabrics that exist like this where you cannot tell the right from the wrong. So if that's you, if you have fabric that looks like this, that you can't tell the difference, what I want you to do is take a piece of masking tape, write the number of the pattern that it is, six or seven, and stick it on the wrong side of your fabric, on each and every single one of them. And the wrong side of your fabric should look like this. It's the outside, not the inside. The outside, not the inside. If you don't do what I've asked you to do, you could potentially sew your two legs together in the incorrect way. It's happened to me before multiple times. So once again, I'm going to just tell you really quickly, take a piece of masking tape, write the number on it, and put one piece of tape on the outside of your fabric on both sides. That will indicate that it's the wrong size and not on the inside. Okay, so I'm going to unpin all of my, my fabric like this, and then I'm going to pin it according to what it has there and then I'm gonna throw it in the sewing machine. Excellent, so we're still on step one. I'm gonna take one of my number sixes and one of my number sevens and match them up together and pin them at the inner leg. When we sew, almost 90% of the time, we're gonna be sewing with our right sides together. So I wanna put my right side up for my first pair of pants, or my first leg, I mean. And I'm gonna open this up, and you can see that this is gonna be either the crotch or the butt of my pants, and this is my inner leg. I can tell it's my inner leg seam. 
because there's a notch right here. So I'm going to lay this one on top, right sides together, like that. I've got two notches right here. It's kind of hard to see because I'm the exact color right now, but my two notches match up. And that's where I'm going to start pinning. I also wanted to show you that when I'm matching my fabric up, I want you to know that you are in charge of where your fabric lies. Right now it's kind of tricky because there's a lot of static in it and it's not working with me, but I'm taking the edges of my fingers to work it. I'm not stretching or pulling it, just gently working it to where it needs to go. And once I've got it where I want it to go, my notches are matched up right now. I'm going to pin it perpendicularly to the edge. The ball of my, my needle or my, my pin is sticking out just like this. And now I'm going to work on the top. I want those two edges to match up perfectly. So I'm going to put a pin in there. And I'm just going to be smoothing out the fabric as I go. Again, if you have any, if it's not matching up perfectly, you're in charge. So keep moving your fingers and lining it up so that it is perfect. If you've cut really, really terribly, this will be hard, but chances are you did a good job cutting and you just need to be a little patient and smoothing that fabric to where it needs to go. As I'm coming here to the end, if your ends don't match up perfectly, it's not going to be the end of the world. You want them to be as close as possible, but it's not going to be the end of the world. Okay, great. That's my inner leg right here. I did want to show you this. When my inner leg is pinned, my top edge right here does not match up. And that's okay. That's what I was talking about earlier. This is a single notch and that's a double notch. They don't need to match up. Mostly because when it's, when it's done being sewn, one is going to wrap all the way around your body. And so we don't want to match them up. Okay, great. Next is the sewing machine. Here we go. So now I've pinned both of my legs. I've got a six and a seven together. And I also have the hiccups. So I wanted to warn you before they started coming. I'm ready to start sewing. On my sewing mach machine, <clears throat> I put a blue piece of tape to show me where that five-eighths line is. I've changed my... Th thread in my bobbin so that they're a purple color. They will match and look really nice. I'm going to line my uh, my fabric up along my blue line or if you're using one of the sewing machines in the classroom, that 15 line. And I'm ready to go. As I'm sewing, my goal is to keep that line as straight as possible, make it really nice and neat. Go as slow as you need to. I'm going to speed up the video. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to speed up the video so that uh, you don't have to watch me sew the whole time. Man, I'm sorry about these hiccups. Um, but go as the speed that you need to go, making sure to backstitch at the beginning and the end of your whole project. Don't forget that. My machine is re really nice because I've got a button that will do my backstitching for me. And as I'm, ready, as I'm going, I'm going to take out those pins before I sew over them, because we don't want to sew over our pins. I finished both of the inner leg seams, and I'm ready to to finish now uh, my seams. And what I mean by finished seams is uh, to do something to the edge so that it makes it less likely to fray in the future. If you have a serger available to you, if you're in the classroom, I 100% recommend serging. Hip! The hiccups are still here, I'm so sorry. Uh, it is a really awesome way to finish the edges and I'll show you how to do that. The other thing you can do if you do not have a serger at home or in the classroom is just take this over to the ironing board and just press your, your seams open. It's just going to make your life a lot easier. But for right now, I'm going to show you how to serge and then I'm going to show you how to press your seams open. So all I'm going to do is take my serger and line it up so that I am not quite, quite cutting off my, my line, my sewing line, but just to the edge so it's nice and clean.
now I have a very nice clean finished edge. When I'm serging I'm making sure and I'm going decently slow to make sure that my fabric doesn't slip underneath the knife edge of the serger and get cut. That's happened to students before and then you just have a hole in your fabric. If you don't have a serger available to you, the next best thing is to press open your seams. So I'm taking my pants and opening them up so that they're not laying double anymore. And I'm going to come to my seam and I'm going to literally open it with my fingers and try to get it to lay flat. So not like this or this where just like one edge just folds over. We want both edges to open up like this. So that's what I'm doing with my fingers. I'm going to just kind of open it and finger press it real quick like that. Then I'm going to take my iron. I'm going to check to make it sure it's warm. Yep. And then I'm going to take the nose of my iron and just slowly press it throughout just like that. And then I'm going to just keep doing that throughout my entire seam. When it lays flat like that, it's a lot easier to work with when you're actually putting your pants together. So I definitely recommend doing that. This is one of my favorite parts where I get to check off that I've done a step. That feels really good. So we're now on step, step two. So I'm going to read that with you real quick. It says, stitch crotch seam, stitch again a fourth of an inch away from the seam allowance along curve as shown. And then it says trim close to second stitching. So that doesn't give you very much information, but the picture does. And so let's take a look at that picture a little bit. What I want you to first see is that you have this little line right here. That's the seam that you just sewed and then pressed open or surged. So essentially we're going to open up our pair of pants and so that it looks like this and put it with its, with its uh, duplicate, the second one. I also want you to see that you've got a line or like a little thread here and a thread here. It's showing you where it's having you stitch. And I want you also to see that you have notches. So you should have a double notch that matches up with another one and a single notch that also matches up. This is a really confusing piece of information. So we're going to do it together. So with this information, what I'm going to do is take my pant leg, I've surged both of them, and I'm going to open them up like this. And when I do that, you'll see that it looks like the picture. So you can see that I've got a double notch right here and a single notch right here. I'm going to lay this right side up on my table and then grab my other piece like this. Open it up and it's the same thing. I've got a double notch and a single notch and I'm just going to lay that straight on my other piece. And then just so you guys can see that. So it's kind of messy right now but I'm going to use my fingertips and I'm going to straighten everything out. Starting with this bottom piece. If you've done everything correctly, then your single notches should match up together and your double notches should match up together. It's kind of magic. And your crotch line should also match up. For the sake of ease, I use, like to use clips if you've got them. So I'm going to first start with the middle crotch line because that's the most important that it matches up. It'll look the nicest and the cleanest. So I'm going to start there and match that up. And then I'm going to come up to my single notch. Line those bad boys up. Clip them. I'm going to do the same thing on the double notch. Okay. So from there, I'm just going to smooth everything else out so it all matches up ever so perfectly. And then I'm ready to sew. Right, here's what it looks like before I sew. I've got my right sides together and all of my notches and my seam is, is uh, lined all up. Alright, so here we go. We're going to sew by lining up the edge of my fabric with my blue line or the 15 line, whichever is the 5 eighths seam allowance. And it's really important that you backstitch at the beginning and the end. Alright, 
So I've got my lovely stitch right there. Okay, if you have a serger, all you have to do is go back through and serge just like you did with the inner leg seam. If you do not have a serger, I still want you to follow the instructions that say to sew again a fourth of an inch away from the edge, which means right in the between the edge of the fabric and your seam allowance of five eighths, I want you to sew in the middle, which is a fourth of an eighth, a fourth of an inch away from the edge. And if you're using one of my sewing machines, that's just the foot edge. The point of this is that this is the crotch seam. This is where you're gonna be doing the splits. You're gonna get in and out of cars. We don't want that to rip on you. So we want that one to be double reinforced. If you're surging, take a look at this bad boy. There are four threads on there. It's gonna be reinforced if you surge it. But if you just use the sewing machine, you're not. So go ahead and surge that or um, stitch it again. Okay, that was awesome. We're moving on to step three. Take a look at this. It says stitch front and back together at sides. And then again, you can see that because I've got white showing, that means that the right sides are inside. So our right sides are together. And you can see the little thread there and a little thread there. That means we're going to be stitching right down here. It also means that our two sides that have double notches are going to be lined up together. The way that I sewed this and surged it, can you see that this does not look like this, right? That does not look right. So I can't stitch this. I had a lot of kids do that. They would stitch down this length because they saw the double notch here. Well, that's not the right double notch. We want these double notches to be matching the other ones. So when they did that, they ended up with like, this where the pant leg, it just was a mess, just believe me. So what I'm gonna do is open this up. <gasps> what? And then open this one up. <gasps> what? And when I unfold it all, look, it looks like a pair of pants. Big pair of pants right now, but it looks like a pair of pants. But right now I've got my wrong sides together, so I need to flip this inside out. Pardon me while I kind of make a mess. It takes a little while. I'll flip it right side or inside out. And match up my notches again. Boom! And now it's a pair of pants with its side seams ready to be sewn. So now I'm going to take them on, put them on my table, and pin them together. My pants are pinned on both sides, uh, on the side seams, and are ready to be sewn. Now that the side seams are done, you can either take it over to the serger like I'm going to do or take this over to the ironing board and press those seams open. So depending on what you have, you want to treat those uh, by pressing them open. It'll make the next step a lot easier. Congrats on being done with step three. Good news, we're skipping step four. It's all about making it easier to put elastic in through your pants and I found that it's not hard at all and so I'm okay with you skipping it. We're going to go down to number five and I'm going to read that to you, but essentially what we're doing is we're just adding the casing at the top of your pants. Casing is just a fancy word for like a little tunnel or I call it like a hallway that you're going to put your uh, elastic through um, that'll allow that elastic to cinch. Now if you look at the instructions and you read through it all in one glance, it's going to get kind of confusing because it's a lot. So we're just going to break it down and do it step by step. It says to form casing, turn upper edge of pants to inside a long fold line, turning in a fourth of an inch on raw edge and press. Okay, so you, the first thing that we need to figure out is where is our fold line? And that can be easily found on our pant pattern. Right here at the top, it says fold line. And that's essentially where we're gonna be folding and putting the elastic in through. This works really well if you have three fourths inch elastic. Now, some of us have had a hard time finding that three and fourth, 
three fourths inch. So if you have one inch or bigger, you're gonna wanna measure your elastic and then add probably a half an inch to that casing. I have the correct amount, so I'm just gonna follow this along. And I'm gonna cheat even, and I'm gonna measure it. I've got my seam gauge right here. This fold line is one and a half, uh, one and a fourth inches. So I'm gonna use that measurement. I'm gonna mark that here with my, with my marker. And that's what I'm gonna be turning my pants to. Then it says after I folded that, I'm gonna fold under my raw edges. And the point of that is that we wanna hide this raw edge. Do you see that I can start to peel it apart? That's not good. We don't want that to be seen at all. So essentially when you're, when you're sewing this, we're gonna fold this under boop, and then fold it under again boop, like that. And so it's a really lovely clean edge. So you can do it one of two ways. You can do it the, in the way the directions tell you where you fold under uh, using the fold line or one and a fourth inches and then fold under the, the raw edge. But I found that it's personally easier if I fold under my raw edge first and then fold again to my um, the four, one and fourth inch. So I'm gonna show you my way and it doesn't matter if you do it your way or not. So I'm gonna show you, I like to use the edge of the ironing board. I'm gonna turn on my iron. And I'll slip my pants in, I'll open them up so that I'm sliding just one layer of pant onto my board like this. This is a really nice trick if you're doing any sort of ironing and you don't wanna iron two layers, you just want one layer. And then I'm gonna take my um, seam gauge and mark one fourth inch for me. And I'm just gonna roll down the edge of my pants, check that it's actually a fourth of an inch, oops, this way. And then I'm gonna take my iron and press it. And you're essentially just gonna do this all the way around your pants. So I'm just kind of making it, I'm just guessing real quick and then I'm gonna come back and measure and fix it. So it's a little big. And this is what we mean by press. Literally press the iron to it and it's gonna make this lovely crease for you. When you're done with that, you roll it to the next section and you're just gonna repeat that all the way around. I just finished um, pressing a fourth of an inch under on my raw edge so that I've got a clean edge now at the top. And now I'm gonna press it one more time to create my casing using my fold line, which was one and a fourth inches. I'm gonna just put that on there. And I'm gonna use this, actually, yeah. So I'm gonna use this and go fold it over one and a fourth like this and measure. And once it's great, I'm gonna press it again. So I'm almost there. I'm strive for accuracy on this and try to get it exactly. So I got my one and a fourth and I'm gonna press. And then I'm gonna pin it as well. And be careful not to pin right after you press because it gets really hot. So I'm just gonna check that again. It's one and a fourth. I'm gonna press that. Let it cool. And pin. I'm gonna do that all the way around. Wish me luck. Now we're ready to read the second part of step five. So we got the first part done. The second part says, Stitch close to the lower edge, leaving an opening. Stitch again close to the upper edge. So we're gonna be stitching twice, and if you look here, you can see two little pieces of thread. The first part is the most important part. It's telling us to stitch to the, close to the bottom edge. It doesn't give us a seam allowance. It just wants us to find a, a marker that's close to this edge and then stitch around it but it also wants us to leave an opening. I like to choose an opening that's near one of the front or the back seams. It's easier to, for me to remember. So that means when I sew, I'm gonna start here, go all the way around, but then end here so that I have this opening. It should be about two inches wide, and that's where we're gonna insert the elastic, and the elastic will go through in that direction. So we'll start with that. Um, then the next step it tells us after we've done that is that it wants you to stitch close to that upper edge. 
Now, that one is just for you to decide if you want to do that. Um, it does actually make your pants look really, really nice. If you can do that line really beautifully, I suggest that. It's a really cool technique and it looks really good, but you don't have to. If you choose not to do that, to make that second stitch close to the top edge, your pants will look more uh, like little kid pants, like where the elastic kind of looks bunchy. But if you do the stitch to the upper edge, it'll look a lot more professional. But again, it's just up to you, which is really the nice thing about sewing is that you get to decide. Okay, so when you go to sew this one, you're going to be sewing in a circle this time, not a straight line. You're going to be sewing this. So my machine has a little part that comes off, meaning I can sew all the way around in a circle like this. On the sewing machines in my classroom, there's a little box that you can just gently pull out this direction and you then also have a circle. So I'm going to start with that. Put my pants in kind of through that circle. And then starting with like kind of leaving an opening, I'm going to stitch close to that lower edge. What I, it's kind of tricky about this is that because you don't have the throat plate or the needle plate to show you the seam allowance, you kind of have to make your own seam allowance that's close to the lower edge. What I'm going to do, since my needle is actually close to the foot edge, is that I'm going to um, just use my foot edge and line that up with the edge of my fabric, but you kind of need to find something that works for you. It is very important that you backstitch at, at the beginning and the end of this because you're going to be putting a lot of stress on this spot. All right, here we go. They are done, and I've got a little opening right there to put my elastic in. What you didn't just see is probably five to seven minutes of me seam ripping. When I stitched my, my lower edge, I apparently did not get it too, close enough to the bottom. I had raised it up, and you can kind of see it right here. So when I went to go put my elastic in, it was too small. So I had to seam rip and start over, which is fine because we all seam rip. It's a good practice in patience and it's good to strive for accuracy. So I'm okay with doing that. So I'm ready for my next step, which is step six. It says to cut the elastic, the measurement of your waist plus an inch, insert the elastic through the opening, lap ends, hold with a safety pin and try on, adjust as necessary. Stitch ends of elastic securely and then stitch the opening. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. I'll show you the way that I like to do it. Instead of cutting my elastic to begin with, what I do is I just keep everything on in one roll, and then I'll use a safety pin to pin the edge. Um, this FCS teacher apparently does not have any safety pins at home. Normally I keep them on my vest, but I must have taken them off. So I have no safety pins. So I used a paper clip, nothing fancy, but I was able to poke a hole in it. So I'm gonna take my, my what I'm gonna call my safety pin, and I'm going to insert it through my opening. If I can find my opening. Where is the opening? Found the opening. Okay, so I'm going to take this and insert it through my opening. And I'm going to do what I call the push-push-pull method. And if you were in 8th grade with me and you did drawstring bags, you'll recognize this. So here's my safety pin. I'm going to put it in my opening and kind of just push the and gather the fabric around the pin. And then pull it so that it goes across my elastic. I'm gonna do it again, push, push, and then hold on to that, pull. Push, push, pull. Okay, I was able to string mine all the way around and I'll show you the next step that I like to do. I will put the pants on and then decide what I need. So what I'd like to do is I want to make sure that I'm holding on to both sides. If you have a safety pin, you could pin that together and it makes it easier to try on. 
Now I'm going to figure out where they fit on my body and how tight I want them to be. Okay, well, that feels about good. I think I have them on backwards. So once I found the size that I want, I'm going to go a little tighter. I'm going to pierce my elastic. If I had a safety pin, it would be a lot easier. And hold my spot. I can take my, I've taken off my pants, but I still have marked where I'm going to cut them. So now I can cut my elastic just like that and save the rest of that because that's good, some good stuff right there. Um, now I want to double, triple, quadruple check that my pants and my elastic are not twisted. So I like to start on one end and work my way down, just making sure that it's not twisted in any way. And if it is, obviously you want to fix it. So there's one. Double check. Okay, I'll triple check it here in a second. Then I'm going to take my elastic and I'm going to lap my ends over. If I can get my pin out. I'll kind of pull out my elastic just a little bit. And I want to lap my elastic like this. This feels easier to stitch, but if you do that, then you're going to have a bump. And that's not where you want to bump. Okay, so we want to lap our ends over like this. I'm even going to put a clip on there to just make sure I hold it. Now with it lapped, I'm going to double check one more time. Well, this will be my triple check. Make sure my elastic isn't twisted. It feels good in there. We're ready to go. And I always say this is where you're going to be mean to your pants. You're going to take your elastic and kind of pull it out so it's easier to sew. With it sewn or with it lapped like this, what I want you to do is take it to your sewing machine and sew a box like this and then an X in the box. Your machine might not like this and it's kind of hard to do, but literally no one will ever see this ever again. The point is that you don't want that to un undo, so it doesn't care if it, I don't care if it's ugly or not, it doesn't matter. Ta-da! There's my box with my X in it. Can I show you something? You promise not to make fun of me? Boop! There's the other side. But, like I said, it doesn't matter if it holds because it's going to get tucked into your pants. So now I'm going to stretch out my elastic like so. Make it look beautiful like so. And now my goal is to just cover up that hole and then stitch across it. So I'm gonna pin it just real quick so it's easier for me to see. The goal is to not sew over your elastic, but just sew it in. Once again, it's important that you backstitch at the beginning and the end. And there you have it. You've got your elastic, and it's ready to go. Before you move on to the next step, this is when you quadruple check to make sure that your elastic isn't um, stitched in there. If you're worried about your elastic twisting while it's in there, what you can do is you can just take it to your sewing machine and stitch what we call stitch in the ditch. There's a little seam right there. You can just stitch right down that seam. Um, and hide it a little bit in the seam and it will keep your elastic from, from turning. We're getting near the end. Can you guys feel it? So our next step is about finishing. Seven and eight are all about making a tie. Uh, the tie is just there ornamentally. Uh, it doesn't actually, it's not a drawstring. You won't actually pull your pants or anything. It's just there to look cute. So I'm opting to not do that just to save myself some time. If you want to do that, 100% go for it. It'll look really good. So you can follow the directions that are pretty simple for 7 and 8. I'm going to skip on down to step 9, and this is all about finishing your pair of pants. Before I get started on that, if any one of you is interested in making a pair of joggers rather than just a loose pair of pants, you're absolutely welcome to do that. A lot of you will have extra elastic, mine sitting on the floor right there, and you can use that elastic to cinch up the bottoms. You essentially do the exact same steps as you did for making your casing on the top of your pants, but you just do it on the bottom. Easy peasy. Okay, I don't really like that. 
Uh, I find that these paints are a little wide and so they kind of look funky as joggers, but they can look really cute. So um, it's up to you what you'd like to do. I'm going to follow along here and kind of show you what I like to do. Okay, it says turn up one and one fourth inch at the hem, so we're talking at the bottom, of the lower let edge of the pants. And then it says baste close to the fold, turn in a fourth of an inch on the raw edge, and then baste hem in place. Okay, so you can follow that exactly as it is, and it's not, not a hard thing to do, but I am going to show you kind of a faster way of doing it. What I like to do is essentially the same thing as doing my pair, the casing, right? So I'm going to take my upper edge and instead of folding it one and a fourth, I'm going to fold that fourth in right now and press that. Makes my life just a little easier. I've got that upper or that raw edge is now uh, a nice clean edge. Now I'm going to take it and fold it one more time, that inch. Now what I would suggest doing before you actually um, before you actually sew is um, pin them like this and try them on uh, because sometimes you might find that that inch is too much uh, and you want to do it less and so that's totally fine. The whole point of this is that you folded it twice so that you've got this lovely clean edge and nothing that looks like that, right? That looks gross, right? So again, fold that to an inch or an inch and a fourth. Try them on. If they need more give, I wouldn't go, go more than two inches, but you can, you can take them in two inches um, or less, depending on what you want. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to pin just a few pins and try them on and see what we think, and then I will sew. Now I've got my two spots ironed, so I ironed the fourth of an inch, and then I also, also ironed one and a fourth inch as well to get this. It's really easy if it's nice and pressed. If you just kind of roll it and don't press it, it's not going to be as easy to sew. Your directions are a little bit more confusing than what I'm going to have you do. Your directions want you to baste along this line and blah blah blah, but what I'm going to have you do is exactly the same thing that you did for your casing. I want you to sew as close to the bottom line as you can and as straight as you can, making sure that you've taken out the part of the machine that makes it so that you can sew underneath the machine and around and around, just like that. Except this time, if you're not going to make joggers, you don't need to make an opening. You can just sew the whole thing around. And if you're going to make joggers, you want to leave an opening, insert your elastic, the same thing that you did with your casing. Okay, here's the hardest part. It's the last step. And it's really easy to mess up on the last step because you get really excited. So take your time, go nice and slow. You should be great. So I'm pretty excited right now because I have a brand new pair of pajama pants that I've made from scratch completely on my own. I'm really excited about them. They look great. This is the point where everything is done, but we want to double check and strive for accuracy. And we don't want perfection, but we want the best we, that we can do. So now that we're done, we want to check all of our lines to make sure that they're as straight as they can be. You want to check to make sure that all of your strings that you have uh, are unattached, trim them, clip them. If you're turning this in for a grade, you want to make sure that you press it, or, or not press it, I'm sorry, you want to iron it and make sure it looks nice. Now, now we quintuple check that our elastic isn't um, twisted in there. Make it look as good as we can do. Fill out a reflection. Um, in your reflection, please tell me what you learned. Be descriptive about what you did and, and what you thought about this. Um, and uh, then once they're graded, go home and take them and wear them whenever you want. It's pretty exciting. Thank you for watching this super long video. Uh, I hope it was helpful and I hope you are encouraged to continue sewing. The best part about this is the skill set that you learn making these pants can be applied to a million other patterns. I have kept all of my patterns. You can see right up there in those shelves. It's kind of messy, but I've got a lot of patterns and um, it's all skills that I learned from making pajama pants, so you can too. Thanks, bye.